Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Underdogs, covering chapters nine and ten. So tonight's discussion, if if you've uh, not read the description yet, is a bit of a tricky one. So give me a second, let me uh, bring the thing up on the laptop so I don't miss anyone's comments. Okay, so tonight's discussion, how do you think neurodiversity, being autistic or dyslexic, etc., might help someone in extreme scenarios? Uh, I'll leave it entirely up to you to define what an extreme scenario uh, actually is, whether, uh, whether it's something underdog scale or whether it's, well, just real life at this particular moment scale. But chapter uh, 9 and 10, keeping it uh, largely spo uh, spoiler free, you're going to be introduced to a few uh, new characters in this upcoming chapter, including one of my favourite slash least favourite creations I've ever come up with. You'll, you'll know him when you, uh, when you see him. Anyway, so uh, I just forgot to get myself a drink, so this last bit of Coke's going to have to get me through the next two chapters. But yeah, when we uh, last left the, uh, the underdogs, they had, mm -hmm. they had just bro uh, broken into New London Citadel, and uh, unfortunately their presence has already been uh, uncovered. The, uh, uh, the villains already know that uh, they have some... Uh, some kind of intruder. So whatever they do, they have to do it very quickly. Yep, Julie knows exactly who I'm talking about, who this new character is going to be, so without wasting any more of your time, I'm going to start reading now. Chapter 9. High up in the safety of floor B, news of trouble had unsettled some very important people. Inside his office, one of the men responsible for the Grant era rested his elbows on his mahogany desk, considering his options. As Marshall brooded over the threat downstairs, his gaze landed on the plaque at the edge of his desk. Ian H. Marshall, Head of Military Division. He had counted himself lucky to keep any position at Marshall Pierce Solutions, following the one-day buyouts from Nicholas Grant. It was almost unheard of, a man walking through a company's front door with enough money to buy their whole business. But that was exactly what had happened. Grant had taken Marshall Pierce in one day, and some years later he had taken Great Britain in the same amount of time. Some people have told me that it's a little bit unrealistic that Nicholas Grant can uh, just walk into Marshall Pierce and just buy them out in one day. I'm pretty sure that's not how real life business, uh, businesses work, but in all fairness, this is a universe where the whole of Britain's been taken over and imprisoned in jar walled citadels by innumerable, innumerable clone soldiers. So uh, you do have to um, suspend your disbelief for, uh, about a few things here. Rather interestingly, the. Um, a slightly depressing uh, bit of feedback I've uh, had, not not depressing about the book, but about society in general, is uh, the, le the least realistic thing in the whole of the Underdog series is that all of the characters from Oakenfold had their needs met at, in special education. Yeah, it, it is kind of like that in Britain. Anyway, back to the story. With an angered sigh, Marshall thought about what else his plaques uh, would, uh, could have read at various points in his life. Ian H. Marshall war veteran and serviceman of 12 years, honourable discharge. Ian H. Marshall, international arms dealer of eight years. Ian H. Marshall, founder of the world's greatest private security firm. Ian H. Marshall, takeover day, strategic mastermind. And because he could not stop himself, he thought about his hated colleague who had once been a lifelong friend, a few doors away at that very moment. Nathaniel A. Pierce, pharmaceuticals genius. Nathaniel A. Pierce, bankrupted scrounger. Nathaniel A. Pierce, only at this desk because his mates gave him half the company. Nathaniel A. Pierce, creator of the clone soldier. Finally, of course, he would have been rude to ignore the most dangerous man in Br British history. Hi, Debbie. Soon to be world history once his master plan paid off. Nicholas Grant, son of some wealthy oil tycoon. Nicholas Grant, unexpected CEO of Marshall Pierce Solutions. Nicholas Grant, the man with the government in his pocket. Nicholas Grant, enslaver of Great Britain. Marshall scraped his fingernails along the desk and rid himself of the distractions in his mind. Keith Tyler had been killed in action the night before, most likely by Shannon herself, and the sooner the invasion blow was dealt with, the less distracted he would be. Hey, Miriam. He seized the phone at his side and dialed the number for Oliver Roth. The phone rang five times without an answer. Marshall checked his watch and swore. Most professional assassins wouldn't be asleep at half-past nine in the morning. Then again, most assassins were older than fourteen. 
Marshall got to his feet and made for the door. It was the wrong day for his teenage deathbringer to sleep in. Hi, Catherine. Oliver, barked Marshall, his fist thumping, on the, uh, thumping the door of Oliver Roth's Flore living quarters. No answer. Of course not. Oliver! Marshall didn't have time to wait. He fetched out his all-access keycard, swiped it against Roth's door, and let himself in. He was met with a sight that made him thankful he had young twin daughters and not a teenage son. The room smelled like only a 14-year-old could make it smell. The assassin's clothes lay dumped on the floor from the previous day, and a motionless character on the television screen suggested Roth had fallen asleep play uh, playing video games. His blood-red wallpaper was part covered by posters of death metal bands, and the mirror and wash basin in his bathroom seemed to be for decoration only. Roth's muscular, uh, muscular body lay sprawled out across his bed, barely covered by his duvet, and the video game controller was loosely gripped in his fingers. Marshall looked for the boy's face, hoping to find it beneath his shock of fiery red hair, and noticed his eyes were still closed. In the old world, Nicholas Grant's master assassin had barely been old enough for a paper round. But Roth's new job gave him all the special perks that the inner city prisoners must have missed. Rich food, electricity, heating, recreation time, and the right to stay up as late as he wanted. And bloody hell did he take advantage of it. Dana says, wait, it's too early, I suppose. Uh, yeah, sorry Dana, I um, I posted about this about 20 minutes ago because it completely slipped my mind to post it earlier in the day. Uh, the clocks in Britain uh, went forward an hour last night, which means uh, for the rest of the world, this is uh, appearing one hour earlier than it's supposed to. So, uh, uh, yeah, sorry about that, but... It should. Uh, I think the rest of the world, except for Australia, has done the whole um, uh, daylight savings thing now. But well, it's only for one part anyway. Where was I? Oh yeah. Marshall reached to his right and grasped the first object. The <laughs> grasped the first object his fingers met. Ironically, it was an alarm clock, which he launched in Oliver Roth's direction. The clock bounced off the boy's right arm, and his eyes flashed open. Ugh, he mumbled. Hi, Ian. Get out of my room, now. Why, would we, why did we bother buying you that thing? Marshall snarled with a judgmental finger pointed at the alarm clock. Ugh, it's not like you paid any money for it. You need to get up. We've got in trip, And you need to get out of my room! Roth was not going to be seen obeying a 14-year-old subordinate. If he gave ground to Oliver Roth, he wouldn't get it back. We've got trouble, Marshall said. Intruders. Last seen in stairwell 42 around floor T but they may have gone upwards since then. Marshall rose his eyebrows in surprise as Roth flung his duvet to one side and got to his feet, wearing nothing but his boxer shorts. He stretched each, he stretched each limb in turn until they cracked, and ran his fingers through his wiry red hair like an animal itching fleas. It was the closest he ever came to brushing. That's some frightening confidence right there, Marshall thought, strutting around in his boxers, unafraid of his boss seeing him. Actually, it's not confidence. He's doing this to make me uncomfortable. Or maybe it's, maybe it's neither, and he truly just doesn't care. Another intrusion? Roth mumbled, rubbing his eyes with one hand and using the other to scratch his armpits. Grant's going to have your head. He's got bigger things on his mind. He's been going on about tonight's dinner for half a week. What could possibly bother him right now? Has his girl stood him up again? Keith's dead. Roth paused and lifted his face towards Marshall's. For the first time, he seemed to respect Marshall's presence in the room. That's weird, he said. Words one word for it. Roth sat back down on his bed, grabbed his controller and brought up the menu on his video game. Last I heard, he said, Keith was heading out to Lambourne's place with a bunch of guards. He shouldn't have taken too much for... Hang on, wait a second. Marshall stomped over to Roth, ripped the controller from his hands and marched back to the door. With any other teenager, he would have smashed it against the television screen, but somehow he didn't feel comfortable doing that to Roth. The lad was right, though. The task shouldn't have been too challenging for a number two assassin superior to everyone in Grant's army except Roth himself. Feel like getting dressed yet? asked Marshall. My room, my rules. So how did Keith die? Let me worry about that. We've got a ton to deal with on floor B, and I do not want to be distracted by feral rats scurrying around inside the walls. Get up, get dressed, get out there, take your rifle and start killing rebels. Roth started to move. Rather ten tellingly, he went to his weapon stash first. Even the bathroom didn't take priority. Marshall walked back, to, uh, back into the corridor, willing to give ground now that Roth had done the same. Hi, Lawrence. Where did you say they were? asked Roth, choosing between two shotguns. Well, at least he's interested now. 
of course he has. He's got more rebels to go after. They were last seen in the northwest end of the citadel, but that's all we know right now. So the sooner you start, the... Roth slammed the door in Marshall's face. Roth rolled his eyes and tried to remember the charming, adventurous 12-year-old that Oliver Roth had been in their early days of working together. There was do no denying the teenager was skilled at his job, but even by assassin standards he had become difficult to work with. Ewan gave the nod. Two handguns flew around the corners of the T-junction, and the guards didn't even have time to raise their eyebrows. The gunshots were close enough to sound like a single blast, and the bullets struck it at the exact same moment. Ewan and Charlie lowered their guns and strolled towards the forensic investigation room as the dead clones collapsed to the floor. I'd give them an eight for synchronised diving, said Charlie with a grin. Ewan took a moment to laugh before checking the bodies for keycards. It didn't take long. Gotcha. He jumped back to his feet and reached for the slot next to the door. The entrance opened without any fuss, and, <clears throat> and Ewan grabbed one of the dead clones by its shoulders. Charlie, clones inside. Why? Hiding the bodies, duh. Yeah, but why inside? We could just stand them up against the walls. Are you having a laugh? No, really, said Charlie with another grin. If someone walks past and sees blood on the walls and, and the guards missing, they'll know something's up. If they see the two bodies placed upright, then at least there's a chance they'd not think to look closer. There might be chairs inside if you want to sit them down on those. Ewan paused, his head gently nodding. Only guys like us could come up with something like that. So bizarre and unexpected that it might actually work. You know what, he said. Let's do it. Cool, answered Charlie, rushing into the forensic investigation room and returning with a steel chair in each hand. <clears throat> Propped upright like macabre shop window dummies, the clones looked semi-convincing once the blood had been wiped away. Hey, you know what else we can do? Charlie continued. We could push them together so it looks like they're making out. Then no one would look closer. Charlie is such a kid. Now get inside. Charlie gave a snarl, like a threatened cat. Ewan wasn't sure what he had done, but decided it was best to, shut up and fo best to shut up and focus on the mission. The two friends made their way through the door, and sealed it shut behind them. The forensic investigation room was huge. Two side walls of uninterrupted filing cabinets stretched from one, one end of the room to the other, with mobile ladders positioned at each end. The chamber almost seemed as tall as its own length, and its arrays of cabinets and storage boxes looked down imposingly on the invaders. Sorry about that, came a faint whisper from Charlie. Hmm? Remember yesterday when I told you never to speak to me like a child? You said a lot of things yesterday, answered Ewan. His busy eyes scanned each horizontal surface for an index. I just hated being a kid. Not, not just the school bits either. In my parents' eyes, I was just kind of tacked on to the side of the family. So things at prime school got messed up and they, they barely gave up. Found it, announced Ewan, as he grabbed the printed manual and started to browse. Sorry, Charlie, your parents didn't care much? You know, if it's not bloody convenient, we can talk back at home. Charlie, thought Ewan, as much as I care about you, your childhood trauma is hardly time sensitive. I'd rather not get caught here. Sorry, mate. But no, said Charlie, they didn't care much, especially when the other kids got me into trouble. Did they ever do that with you, trying to get you to explode? The primary kids found it hilarious when I couldn't, when I couldn't control myself, so they made it happen. And let me guess, replied Ewan, as he tucked the index folder under his arm and headed for the nearest ladder. The teachers blamed you because you were doing all the shouting. Yep, got the same advice every time. Rise above it, ignore them, don't let them bother you, like it was that simple. Did the kids laugh at you too? Ewan lay a hand on the ladder and hid a snarl. Not after I smashed up the classroom a few times. They learned quickly. But then, of course, I'd get expelled and have to teach the kids in my next school not to laugh, and it just kept going from there. Ewan checked the index again for the number he was after. Experience at school and in the battlefield told him to always, always double-check his answers. He caught a glance of Charlie, staring at him in confusion with a hint of hurt. What? asked Ewan. It's just, we were the temper twins at Oakenfold, even at Spitfire's Rise for a while, so how come you grew out of it and I didn't? Charlie stopped in, Ewan stopped in his tracks. That last sentence was enough to distract him from the ladder and send him walking back to Charlie. Mate, you're 15, he began, in a friendship voice which sounded poles apart from his leadership voice. And you're acting like all you're growing up's over and done with. I'm sorry you were treated like crap at school. We both deserve better. And I don't want to sound harsh, but you're letting your past control your future and you need to bloody stop it. The shock in Charlie's face became the most distinctive fe the look in the, the, the shock in Charlie's eyes became the most distinctive feature of his face. Ewan spoke again before his friend could form a response. 
By the way, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, Ewan's last sentence is good advice, by the way, but it is entirely in character for Ewan to say it. You're letting your past control your future and you need to bloody stop it. I didn't grow out of being angry, Ewan continued. I just focused on making the right choices. Whenever, whenever I was able to choose, I mean. It was hundreds of little decisions, really. None of them easy, but I made the right ones whenever I could. People love to blame others for their faults. Parents, teachers, kids, the government, even luck. But in my opinion, we become the people we choose to be. Ewan left a deliberate pause. Charlie wouldn't think of an answer quickly, and Ewan wanted his last sentence to sink in. After that moment, he continued. McCormick became a lecturer, a guy who cared about his maths and his students because that's who he chose to be. No one made him that way. And yeah, some things are out of our control. Your ADHD, my thing, everyone's things. But whenever we get to call the shots, that's different. Whenever we're in control, we're responsible for who we are. Ewan took a step back and saw the whole of Charlie's face. There was confusion, as if the thoughts in his brain had been planted there for the first time. You're a good guy, Charlie. You chose that. But those kids who ganged up on you are gone. They don't have a right to be part of your future. <clears throat> Ewan headed for the ladder once again. He knew it wasn't that simple. The mental scars remained long after hurtful people were gone. His own brain was filled with dozens, maybe hundreds of names and faces from people in his past who, hurt, who had hurt his future. But the words needed to be said. And he wondered how different Charlie's life might have been if he'd taken responsibility for some of his choices a few years earlier. I could have done with that lesson too. If I'd had McCormick's words back in the old days, she'd still be alive. You're not meant to know who that is, of course. So what is your thing? Charlie called after him. Why? Back at Oakenfold, you once told Callum you were autistic, but you aren't like Kate or Jack or anyone. Is it actually true? Uh, technically, yeah. It's not the thing that affects me. Charlie paused as if expecting more, but there was no way Ewan was going to open up about his PDA. You may have gathered, but Ewan is absolutely not at peace of having pathological demand avoidance. I'll tell you at home, Ewan finished, hoping Charlie would forget about it before they reached Spitfire's rise. He clamped his hands around the sides of the ladder to begin his climb. It was the time it was time to get back to work. Right, said Charlie, clapping his hands together in fake enthusiasm. So where do we start, and how long until we give up and move on? We don't, answered Ewan, reverting back to his leadership voice. The backpack's in this room and I'm finding it. And if it's empty? It won't be. Grant won't tamper with evidence before it gets inspected. He's not that stupid. Now wait a second, I've found a priority one drawer. Ewan reached the top of the ladder, opened the drawer and paused in disbelief. He hadn't expected to actually be right, but Tyler's backpack was in the first place he looked. There was much to be said for a good filing system. Ewan recognised the backpack instantly. He had seen it on Tyler the previous night. A minor detail he had barely committed to memory, but the black and metallic grey colour scheme was distinctive enough once he saw it. He undid the zip and dipped a hand inside. What's the time? he asked. Doesn't matter, said Charlie. I want to know how long the dead clones have been outside. It's 9.37, answered Charlie. In the morning. And believe it or not, it's still April 25th. Three days to my 16th if you can scavenge a present from somewhere. Charlie, get on the radio. Charlie, sow, uh, Charlie sighed loud enough for his brain... Th <laughs> Charlie sighed loud enough for his breath to echo off the filing cabinet walls. He took the radio out of his pocket and raised it to his mouth. When he pressed the button, he was met with silence rather than the usual static. I think we forgot to turn the volume back up. Ewan huffed. They had turned their radios down just before launching their surprise attack, but single-mindedness had always been a problem with Ewan's, and the sight of the forensic investigation room had made him forget his radio even existed. Guys, said Charlie after turning the volume up, we- Where the hell have you been? came Alex's yells in the speaker. We've been trying to reach you for ages. Yeah, we're fine, thanks, said Ewan. Talk to me, what's up? They know we're here. The blood drained from Ewan's face. He looked down at Charlie, who had frozen at the foot of the ladder. Already? A clone got away. A while ago now. Ewan's hand dug deeper into Tyler's backpack, but didn't stay there for long. Whatever you're up to, continued Alex, finish it fast. I wouldn't worry about us, said Ewan. We're done here. He held his prize down towards Charlie. In the palm of his hand lay a USB stick with the words Better Days written with thick marker pen. What the hell's that? Charlie whispered. Shannon's tool. And you know that because... Do you really think Keith Tyler would carry precious memories around with him? It's the one thing in his backpack that's definitely not his. 
Ewan looked at the, U- at the USB stick and smiled. Better days were definitely coming, if Shannon could be trusted. Keep the route clear for us, Alex. We're coming up. End of chapter 9. And almost as if Julie is following with an actual copy of Underdogs in her hands, she posted that discussion question at the precise right moment. So it's a nice discussion question for anyone who has opinions on the matter. How do you think being neurodiverse, autistic, dyslexic, etc. might help in some kind of extreme scenario? Right, is there anything I've not yet mentioned before just moving on to chapter 10? Uh, No, don't think there is, but if you have any questions, comments, uh, things that you don't understand or just uh, general insights about the story, feel free to post them and I'll uh, I'll respond as I go. I think when I I started uh, doing this, uh, this live online stuff, I decided to save all the questions to the end of the chapters, but Actually, I think I think it's better for you to take the occasional break within a chapter, uh, as long as it isn't done in a way that uh, destroys the flow of the story. But anyway, <clears throat> chapter ten. Oh yes, and uh, Julie has just posted the uh, the link to Underdog's Facebook page. Yeah, please do follow that. Chapter ten. Jack didn't mind that the job of phoning comms had fallen to him. It gave him a nice break from endlessly looking left and right along the corridor connected to their exit, like a small child trying to cross the road. He slouched against the door to the tunnel, his fingers scraping along the greying paint. To most other people, the corridors would have looked dull and boring. Jack understood why, but he refused to accept it for himself. There was genius in every conceivable object if he knew where to look. There was one great advantage to being a daydreamer with Asperger's. While the rest of the population busied themselves with gossip and wasted time about what Sheila said to Tony or whatever, Jack's brain was solving theoretical problems. It was trying to work out how planets uh, would orbit a binary star system, or what kind of weaponry would we would be needed to bring down a charging triceratops. One split second. As with yesterday, occasionally I come across something in the first novel that kind of should impact something I've already written in the follow-ups. Anyway... As he, guarded, as he had guarded the exit, Jack Hopper had been studying the architectural requirements of the ceiling. A lot of effort must have gone into its design, and it would be a shame for it to go unrecognised. But duty called, so it was time to give McCormick a call. He started, started the timer on his watch the moment he inserted the battery into his phone. He dialed the number for comms, but decided against a video call. Voices would be enough for this conversation, and he needed to save his eyes for the corridor. But once the phone was answered, no voice emerged just a shy cough. Hey Simon, Jack began. Is McCormick there? No answer. I guess not then. Lou break? A little grunt. Didn't think he'd go so early in the mission. Is his cyst acting up? An identical grunt. Everyone communicates, Jack thought. Even people who don't talk. Back at Oakenfold. Jack shook his head to silence his last memories of the profoundly disabled students. It had been Mark who had shouted across that field, get bloody running, they're not worth it. But Jack and everyone else had obeyed, largely through fear of saying no to a man like Mark. Few people had spoken about the incident in the 11 months since, but he could tell the group felt varying degrees of remorse. And Jack, despite his logical brain telling him there had been no other choice but to run, had crystal clear opinions about right and wrong. As a result, his conscience was still swamped with inconsolable guilt. He brought himself back to reality and spoke. Simon, there's something important to need to tell McCormick. Our presence has been detected. Simon fell into a short silence that Jack could not interpret. Perhaps shorter words were needed. Simon deserved better than being just known as the Downs kid, and Jack made sure to treat him better, but his learning difficulties still needed to be respected. I mean, Grant knows we're here. Anyway, while we're waiting for the old man, I've been meaning to chat with you for a while. Silence. Hope you don't mind, but I need to ask. Why are you so nervous all the time? A little cough and a huff of protest. Well, most of the time. I know people are nervous these days. I know most people are nervous these days. But you pretty much curl up like a hedgehog when people are around. Even at the dinner table. Jack wasn't sure how Simon felt. But everything must have been fine. He had asked with his friendliest voice, after all. I'll put it to you this way, mate. Thomas lost his mum back in January. He deserves to be nervous, but he's not. Ewan's family were annihilated on takeover day. 
but somehow he's turned that into something positive. He's driven by getting justice for them. Then there's Shannon, he thought. Hell knows what happened to her. You deserve far more confidence than you have, you know. You're an underdog for Spitfire's Rise and one of the last guys who can save this country. You need to have as much faith in yourself as Ewan and McCormick do. <coughs> Hello, Josiah. <laughs> Simon grunted. Somehow, even Jack could tell it was a, yeah, right. No, I'm serious, Jack continued. Confidence might even get you a girlfriend one day. Simon gave a short laugh. And, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Same for me. Romance isn't my thing, Simon. You must know it. Simon laughed again. And not with Gracie. Seriously, why does everyone keep saying that? Just because we're vaguely friends doesn't mean I suddenly want her as my wife. A third snort of laughter. Uh, okay, I guess she's hot. But hot in a first to die in a horror film kind of way. You love horror films, right? You seem like that kind of guy. Bet you love a good slasher. Even more laughter, this time with Simon's actual voice. Jack was reminded of the happy, laughing teenager that Simon Young had once been, back at Oakenfold where everyone had loved him. His sense of humour had been magnificent back then, delivered non-verbally to perfection. And despite most of the general public ignoring his humour, he had been valued for it at his special school. Suddenly, Jack's brain woke up and he was in, in the grey corridor again. The conversation had soaked up his attention span. He checked his watch and found one minute of safe time remaining. Is McCormick back yet? Simon gave the kind of grunts that meant no. Better let you go then. If Grant's locked on onto my phone, I'll be traceable in less than a minute. Talk soon, Simon. Jack removed the battery from his phone, put them both in separate pockets and sighed. He felt safe from attackers while talking on the phone. It seemed against common sense, the type of thinking that made his teachers describe his brain as the good kind of different. But he knew nobody would kill him with a witness uh, listening on the other end. In a rare moment of people reading excellent, Jack had been right. With the phone disconnected, Oliver Roth sees his chance. What the hell? shrieked Jack, as New London's most prolific assassin sprung from the corner with his trademark grin plastered across his spotted face. Today, he had chosen the shotgun. Surprise, retard! he bellowed with a sadistic laugh. And yet, just like in cha uh, chapter one, as much as I absolutely despise that word, it is the villains who say it, and it's entirely within their character to say it. And... Uh, I was thinking about it, uh, this earlier, uh, actually. I'm, I'm not sure wh uh, whether the best way to beat an attitude you don't like is to keep completely silent about it. I think possibly that uh, the best way of beating it is to only assign it to the people who who are undesirable, so, uh, so to speak. So in making sure that it's only the villains in this book who are uh, saying it, I suppose what I'm basically saying is only villains would use the R word. <laughs> By the time the first blast had left the shotgun, Jack had wrenched the exit door in front of him. Little dimples emerged in front of Jack's eyes as the pellets rattled into the metal. The breath froze in his lungs. Those would have gone through his face. The gunshot echoes faded, and the sound of marching footsteps grew. Toby, don't worry about me, Jack screamed. Just get to floor Y. I'll meet you there. With seconds draining away, Jack was sure he could see the, pulse, see the blood pulsing through his own hands. His invention of Toby was desperate, but all he had. The promise of a rebel on the floor above would sound irresistible to Oliver Roth. Wait, he thought. Shannon's list came from New London. He knows none of us are called Toby. Jack fumbled his pistol to his fingers. If he could avoid the second blast, he could strike back before his aggressor could reload. But the idea was short-lived. There was no chance of Roth, Roth using his final cartridge without good reason. And if Jack threw a hand around the door to shoot blindly... His enemy was more than good enough to blow it straight off. Come out, come out, wherever you are, sneered Oliver Roth, with the kind of voice a bullying brother would use to make younger siblings cry. There were no other options. Jack shuffled back into the open tunnel exit and slammed the door closed. Alone in a claustrophobic passage, Jack held his pistol towards the doorframe with a te terrible shaking in his hands. If he fired two shots a split second apart, there would be at least a foot between the bullet holes. Oliver Roth could have been five seconds away from opening the door, or maybe 20 minutes. Or maybe he would open it at that moment while Jack was distracted by wondering when the moment would be. Jack's gasps trembled as they left his tightening throat. SAS soldiers and special forces had the ability to freeze in position for minutes, hours, and sometimes days before taking one vital shot. But not Jack Hopper, an untrained 17-year-old who spent half his life daydreaming. The worst part was not knowing. Was Roth half a mile away chasing Toby? Was he two metres away from two metres away with a palm resting on the door handle? 
Was he waiting for Jack to make the first move? Maybe I should move first anyway. He might not be there. Should I take a leap of faith and step back into the corridor? Or should I just run home? I'd live that way. <clears throat> New scene. You know what would be great to do? Asked Charlie. Just while we're here? Go upstairs, destroy the clone factory and get out before we're caught? Ewan slid down the ladder, with better days zipped up in his pocket. Charlie was an ambitious guy, which was no bad thing, but a dose of realism might have helped once in a while. No, Ewan, this is a good one. Aren't you curious about where Shannon got that list? McCormick once told me about an officer's sector on Floor S. You know, one of those humans-only places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'd love to see it, but not today. It might tell us what else Shannon knows, and a little about her, too. Seriously, we even brought a door combination hacker. Not today, Charlie. Ewan marched towards the door, his mind running through McCormick's directions to floor F. Hopefully Alex and Kate had left the path clear. Then something flickered at the bottom of his field of vision. A shadow interrupted the carpet of, carpet of light under the door. Charlie, he whispered. Someone's outside. Charlie brought his assault rifle up to his waist. Looks like the trick of the bodies didn't work, he whispered back, tiptoeing to the door and resting his fingers on the handle. Ewan stood one step behind him, the muzzle of his own rifle pointed towards the doorframe. Open door, shoot, close door. Nothing else, Charlie. Charlie nodded. He opened the door, and Ewan almost leapt out of his skin. There were at least twenty clones in the corridor. Ewan's heart made a solitary beat before twenty fingers pulled back on twenty triggers. Watch it! he shrieked, firing off the few rounds he could without endangering his friend. Charlie emptied his chamber into the crowd, and Ewan counted three falling bodies before Charlie leapt back behind the door and kicked it shut. Ewan got to work on the filing cabinets pulling a whole column of drawers outwards to provide cover. On the opposite side of the archive, Charlie began to mimic him. Pretty sure these aren't bulletproof, he shouted. What else have we got? There's literally nothing else in the room. Ewan opens the final cabinet in front of his face as the remaining soldiers surge through the door. Charlie was the first to open fire. He shot the cabinet at the bottom of his column and sprayed a hail of bullets that turned five clones into falling bodies. When the survivors took aim towards Charlie, Ewan slammed a a drawer shut at the top of the from the top of his ladder and attacked from a second angle. He fired enough bullets to distract the crowd, and by the time Charlie had resurfaced at the ceiling, they had narrowed down the death squad to five. The angrier soldier at the front, the short model with the long black hair, began a final charge to the other other side of the room, hoping an attack from the other side of the cabinets would be less futile. When his bravery was rewarded with a hail of bullets to both sides of his body, the last four clones fled through the entrance into the safety of the corridor. Not out of fear, but from cold strategy. Hi Kim, hi Tyler if you're watching as well, and hi Zoe. Clear? asked Charlie. For now. Still think we've got time for that officer's sector? Charlie didn't answer. Ewan slid down the side of his ladder and landed two-footed on the ground with his eyes fixed on the closed entrance. Why were they waiting for backup? asked Charlie. There was already a ton of them. Obviously they didn't think 20 was enough, Ewan answered. Well, to be fair, said Charlie with a laugh, waving his assault rifle towards the corpses on the archive floor. Don't relax just yet, Charlie. Ewan reached into his rucksack of gadgets and took out a smoke grenade. He pulled the pin, counted to three, jerked the door open and threw the grenade as it started to smoke. He slammed the door a moment before a string of bullets rattled into the metal, and by the time he had counted to five and opened it again, the room was filled with thick, unnavigable smog. Charlie opened fire alongside him, and they escaped through the cloud to the sound of all four bodies hitting the floor. (laughs) <laughs> all right, thank you Zoe uh, enjoy your time outside and I hope you uh, hope you enjoy this when you get a time, uh, time to listen to it <clears throat> was it left or right at the T-junction? asked Charlie left, back the way we came until we reach Ewan was interrupted by a discreet high-pitched whine from the end of the corridor like the wheels on his late cousin's remote controlled car speed mine Ewan poked his head around the left side of the T-junction A crudely shaped metal package on wheels scuttled along the metallic floor, faster than a running man and bumping against the walls as it charged. Give me a split second, I need to make a note about something. Okay. Ewan's first bullet penetrated the metal casing and broke the mobility circuit, and the mine's response was instant. The explosion spilled balls of erupting fire through the corridor, wobbling the walls and ceiling panel in a violent Mexican wave, and threw the shattered body of the mine into the air like a tossed pancake. I think their backup just arrived, cried Charlie, bolting down the right-hand path. Ewan followed, 
running backwards to guard their rear against a second approaching speed mine. Ewan fired a second bullet, answered by a second explosion. Th <clears throat> Through the dying flames, the mine's controller appeared from around the next corner, alongside a group of his squadmates. He held a third speed mine under his arm, his remote control occupying both hands. It was a short clone with the long black hair again, grown from the same model as the one who had charged between the filing cabinets. This one had the exact same expression of controlled anger on his face. It's just not your day, is it? muttered Ewan, as he aimed his rifle with millimetre precision and shot. The bullets popped through the metal casing of the speed mine under the clone's arm. The wall shook again with a welcome boom as the mine's explosion tore the clone to pieces and engulfed his friends in a searing wave of fire. How do we get to floor F now? yelled Charlie. Ewan bit his lip in disgust before shouting his answer. We don't. We tell the others to get the hell out of New London. What about the clone factory? We've got Shannon's weapon and we're still alive. That's enough. And that's the end of chapter 10. So, yep, they've been discovered. Clones are after them. They know exactly where they are. And um, Oliver Roth has been introduced and uh, he's quite good at his job. So, yeah, things aren't exactly going to plan. And that's uh, basically it for, uh, for today. Um, apologies for uh, for those outside of the UK who uh, who didn't realise or weren't told that uh, the hours went uh, went forward. But well, th uh, this time t uh, tomorrow for the foreseeable future is when uh, when these live readings are going to be. If you want to um, uh, want to follow Underdogs on uh, on Facebook, uh, I'll post the. Uh, the links now actually um yeah give me a second <clears throat> how do i even do <sighs> yeah you think that leaving a comment with ah here we go now i can Here we go. So that, uh, that's the link to Underdogs' Facebook page if anyone's in interested. And um, yep, Drew's now said she's posted all the links. That, uh, thank you very much. And uh, yep, you're welcome, Debbie. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, pretty much everyone has already logged off and stopped listening now, so I'm not going to take up any uh, any more of your time. Um, I will see you tomorrow for chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 12, Keeping It Spoiler Free, is one of my favourites. Um, Largely because it's just so distressing. In fact, um, I'm sure Judy will tell you at the time exactly how uh, how distressing it was. Anyway, take care. See you tomorrow.